Kevin. Good. I'm hanging. You? Good, good. Yeah, no, you're good. Like three. You might want to flip it. <laughs> In studio, DJ Gene Hunt, promoter extraordinaire, John Hunt. Coming up, we get into it, the history the business and the culture of Chicago house music on the vintage house show with your main man, Mega. Stay tuned. So when I saw the end. I push the button on I'll just put the volume. Um, yep, turning the knob. Can you hear anything coming through? Yep, you can hear that one. Is there another jack on that corner? Yeah, it's going over. Yeah, it's going down there too. Last year, the year before last, John, can you um come up to the countertop so we can get you in the shot? Here, um, there we go. Um, as recently as last year, Gene, uh, I want to say right about a year, year and a half ago, Gene Hunt to my right here, y'all. John Hunt, I did a party. Oh. You had to go with Chris Underwood, and then I came and did Joe's on that Black Terry show. Joe, sure, okay. Yeah. I came to you know, practice the day when it was. It might have been two, might have been two years. Maybe. Well, we are honored to have you here on the Mega Presents episode of Vintage House. My pleasure and, being here. Do it. And our audience is live on our stream on the Facebook page, on Twitch, we're live. So we're listening to Taz. No, we're actually listening to Jazzy. Jazzy's still yeah, playing. Yeah. Taz is up, right. queued up next, and we're gonna bring that, we're gonna bring it down and get into the conversation. <laughs> All right, all right. Y'all remember that? All right, all right, all right. Work that. All uh, right. Yeah. Having a flashback moment here on the Vintage House Show because it is the Vintage House Show. It's your main man, Mega, in studio with Gene Hunt. What's up, Gene? What's going on, y'all? How y'all doing out there? And John Hunt. Yo, yo, yo. What's up? What's up? We call this episode On the Hunt with the Vintage House Show because. You know, a little play on words there. Y'all don't mind that, do you? <laughs> we are uh, excited to have uh, the Brothers Hunt because they've got a unique and uh, epic story to tell about their contributions to the evolution of Chicago's house music scene. And so we're going to get into it as we do every Wednesday night, 10 p.m. on WNUR. Vintage House, Vintage House Spotlight Show, the After Spotlight Show, 
we are a franchise, y'all, and we thank you for all that you do to support us. Uh, Gene Hunt, DJ Gene Hunt, artist Gene Hunt, tell us how you got started in Chicago's house music scene. Well, it happened a long, long time ago. Uh, I have to say it starts really about 1985, like when I first got my taste of it, as far as uh, going out, checking out the scene, checking out the atmosphere and so forth. You know, I used to go out with a lot of... And um, they started like maybe in the mid 80s, I started going to hotel parties and stuff like that, just trying to get my taste of it. I think I got my first dose of house music because uh, uh, the guys I were hanging out with, they were obviously a lot older than me. They were in high school and I was just about to graduate from grammar school. What grammar school did you attend? I attended Mason. Mason on the west side. West mm -hmm. side mm -hmm. in high school? I went to Farragut. In Farragut mm -hmm. High. Yeah. Farragut yeah. Uh, Admirals. Yeah, Admirals, exactly. Stand up Admirals represent. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. <laughs> so you were um, a Mason student, but going to high school parties. Exactly. I mean, pretty much, I was kind of like in the seventh grade, you know, you know, tinkering around with music when I first started messing around with turntables and stuff like that. So I really didn't start getting like my first taste of my first dose until like maybe right around the time I was graduating from grammar school. So I mean, ultimately once I got in high school, maybe by my freshman year, I was like playing out doing parties and stuff like that. So Curfews and, and any of that uh, no, club? Man. Well, for some reason, my Age mom kind of trusted yeah. And me, as far as hanging out with the individuals that I was hanging out with at the time, um, she kind of let me like do my thing. Okay. I mean, that was one thing that I can definitely say. It wasn't a, it wasn't a discrepancy about me going out late at night because of the people that I was hanging out with. You know, they were very trustworthy, socially like responsible. Standard. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So she didn't really have an issue about me going out to like some of the parties. Like you know, I would go to the playground and certain places like that, candy store. Yes. She, and she'd be like, oh, you know, how was the night? I would come in three, four, five o'clock in the morning. You know, I'm still next day. Kid. Yeah, next day. <laughs> so I would have had that experience. And she said, well, how did you like the party? I'm like, mom, the party was cool. And I see these guys wearing these Georgia Armani tank tops and Chabot. You know, it was a fashion thing. The designer wear, yes. Right. So, you know, they was like, well, you know, if you want to get the kind of stuff that we wear, because this is what we wear. We're in high school. Like, you know, we got to take you to Evergreen Glass with the big spin crothers and Get you some Georgia Armani GA tank tops, and you got to get the, you know, the Gucci with the with the belt buckle and the Chabot pants with the tags <laughs> and all that. So, you know, they turned me on and showed me like the different gear to get. So I started getting into that because the guys that I hung out with, they had like immaculate taste when it came down to dressing. Yeah. So I was like, you know, I'm, I didn't know. So you know, I started going and buying my GAs, you know, my GA tank tops, and my first set of Jabos and all that type of stuff, you know. <laughs> One time I think I had the house haircut, the box, and all that. You know, so, I love it. We talk. Yeah, so that was kind of like my thing coming up. And, and then I think I bought my first record. I think my first house record I bought was at a record store. i never forget. It was a record store on 87th and Ashton. It was called Spectral Vision. And I think the first record that I bought was a Harold Melvin and a Blue Notes album. Was the okay. My first record because it was kind of different because um, back then, I'll say like maybe around 84, 85, these guys went to Simeon. I lived on the west side at the time. Okay. So I would always come visit my mom on the south side because she was dating this guy. And I would always come over there on the weekends. And that's when I would hang out with them. When I hang out with my mom, she let me go out to the parties. My grandmother raised me. So, I mean, so you know, I was always on the west side. So once I learned how to mix, I would always grab like the certain records and like the intuitive stuff that I learned out south. And then I would come back on the west Bring side. Bring it west. Like, hey man, check this out. Where you get that from? Like you out there hanging out with them guys out south. So I would come back out west and, you know, some of them from here. And that's how I just got to you know, going back and forth. So I, I want to go back for a moment because you talked about something that I often relay as 
an important part of, of this movement in Chicago. And that was the apparel, the fashion, mm -hmm. right? You started and you were influenced by guys who were into the fashion designer scene. And, mm -hmm. and I take it that you were wearing these uh, designer clothes to the, the parties that you were attending. Were you a dancer or were you just showing up at the parties? And no, I really wasn't a dancer per no. se. I remember. My thing was the fashion statement because, you know, I would see some people that would go like the thrift stores. Yeah, They go to thrift stores and buy the old blazers. They buy the real big pants. And, you know, uh, sometimes they go on State Street and buy the penny loafers with the pennies in them. Yeah. You know, the hot dogs. Well, yeah, you had to put your own pennies in them, right? You, you, you couldn't <laughs> yeah, buy them with them. <laughs> right. Of course, you know, Genera. Oh, Benetton. Wow. You took all that was back. You know, Tree Torns, you know, Stan Smith. All that stuff was back in back in the day. Like you had the girls that's wearing the lower Bugatti glasses, and I mean it was more of a fashion statement. Yeah, people would come to the party shop as a night, mm -hmm. you know, with the box haircuts and the Versace haircuts, or they had like dance groups called Ecstasy and Ambassadors, mm -hmm. and they would come and they would like paint their faces. Ah, right, that's why I was wondering. Dance and slam dance, and if you were a dancer, and no, all, but no, no, I would just always come to the parties, but I always admired their uniqueness yeah. as far as the way attire was structured back then and now. So when did you make the switch from spending your hard-earned cash on clothes to, to vinyl? It kind of happened both at the same time because I would always, like when I was younger, younger, like in my beginning, what I would do, I would go for the, like I would make like little errands around the house and I would get allowance and so forth. And sometimes like I'd go down to imports and I would go down to Loop Records I would catch the train all the way from Pulaski, all the way down to Loop Records on Plymouth Court, or you know, or go to Loop Records on yeah on, on State Street. I'm sorry, Loop was on State Street, mm -hmm. and Imports was on Plymouth Court. Yeah, so I would get cool with the lady in the train, like the lady who gave you the transfer. Yeah, I would go to the store for her <laughs> and, and super make runs for her, get and you a super a super transfer. Yeah, she give me a, either a super transfer, or she give me a round trip. She a staple. I go to the store for her, whatever. So I create a relationship that way. And sometimes I'm back in the day, we used to hustle pop bottles, whatever we had to do back in the day to get music. And I would save my money up and I would go all the way downtown just to buy one or two cuts. This is also important. The fact that you were buying the music in the downtown area, but also we talk a lot about the, the transit system as instrumental in the spread of house music because the you were transfer on Sunday to a dollar seventy five was very effective. You were moving through the city, <laughs> south side to west side, west side to yeah. south side, yeah. and I, I and so I want to hear a little bit from John, okay. where there were parallels, if any, or did you have a totally different experience? Well, and and you need to come over yeah, to, to the yeah. mic. Well, back in the day, uh, I first started doing. Uh, stepping music, stepping parties with Kirk Townsend and, and get, Ken Samuels. Okay, but before you got there, what was your pathway? What high school? What grade school? Well, I'm, let me tell you. Something. Yeah, all right, you okay. go for it. So I, I'm, I'm just Samuels the interviewer. Was, uh, <laughs> we call him Uncle Ken because he had all the sound equipment, and they were playing stepping music around the city with Sam Chapman and Herbert Kent. And I got involved with that. And then Kirk Townsend came around and brought his cousin Steve Poindexter. H Happy birthday and belated to uh, Kirk Townsend. Yeah. He just had a celebrated a birthday, right. by the way. And um, Kirk had a contract at Mendel. He, he went to Mendel. So he brought me and Steve along. We started doing the parties there. Started DJing there at that point. And uh, from there, it just kicked off. Start doing all the high schools in the city of Chicago. And uh, that's how it kicked off with me. So you were based on which side of town? South side. You were south side. South side, South Shore. Okay, in the South Shore community. A Did, preppy. Is that where you went to, to high school too? Yeah, south, south Shore High School. South Shore High School. What, what do they call the South Shore? Uh, yeah. I can't All right. That. For those of you tuned in that went to South Shore, come on, represent, help us out here. Right. Um, so you started 
and you were influenced by those guys as a DJ. Yes, sir. Yeah. But you're known as a promoter. Okay. Fair? Yeah, good call. Okay. So I had a DJ group called Wall to Wall Sounds, which Ken Sanders, his music company was called Wall to Wall Sounds. And we had four or five different DJs, and I decided to let them play, and I started promoting parties. Um, how, how difficult I, was I, it to step aside from the decks and let somebody else okay. spin at your party? I'm going to keep it real with you. I really wasn't a good DJ. Okay. Okay. My forte was uh, PR. Yes. And talent. I knew talent. Gene Hunt, Ferris Thomas, Terry Hanna, Lil John, James Derry. I knew them. I knew talent. And that's what I wanted to do. Play to exactly. your strengths. Exactly. Explore I love their that. talent. Also, bring house music to the masses. I helped that by having parties at all the high schools, Creole, Creole, and, and just suburbs everywhere. So um, my forte is promotion. Yeah, that's what I have a passion for. And so you're a connector. You're connecting the talent to the audiences in a in a unique way. How, how did you get the word out? We, we there wasn't social media right when you started. Oh no! So we, how did you we do didn't this? We have Facebook like we mm -hmm. have now. It's well, full now. <laughs> very interesting you said that because um, we call it old school. We call it. It's really in the books. It's grill up promotion, and uh, we went out, passed out flyers. Yes. 10, 15, 20,000 flyers, literally to every high school and every, we try to get to each kid in every high school. We were out at seven in the morning, come in at five in the evening. And some nights it was longer than that because we hung posters. We Tell us to, about the posters. This is part of, you know, Chicago's rich history. So there were poster wars, of course. We, we well, what, the, the, yeah, we elaborate a little bit more uh, later on the poster wars. It was a place called Showtime in Earl Park, Indiana. Tribune Show Tribune, Park. Tribune Show Park. It was in Earl Park. So we had to drive all the all way, way out, out there. Like in the country, <laughs> like a little past Indiana. Oh. So they didn't get our posters and they had like a big barnyard, right? Yeah. These were like country people, but they were great people. So sometimes we come, all right, we said, you guys are already here. We got your job done, but if you guys want to come in and eat some dinner, you come eat some dinner. These people were like the most nicest people in the world. And still are. I mean, like, and the crazy part was we would take this drive. Because I remember one time, I can tell you, a, like, a small story. Me and J.R. Yeah, Deontay mm -hmm. went and took a trip. John had called me and said, why don't you go and ride out there with J.R.? Because J.R. going out there, you getting your posters for your party. J.R. going, he can show you how to go. I said, well, no, I want to order. He said, you'd be better off just taking the drive. So I'm seeing cows <laughs> and farmland and all this and i'm like dude where we going he's like man we almost there so we pull up in this farm i'm like this the company i'm thinking i'm gonna see this big office building right no it's a barnyard it's just an independent company but they make the best most solid posters you can ever make it was fun to have oh it's finally a pleasure to meet you i print a lot of put a lot of posters with your name on it like you know <laughs> and i'm like well it's a pleasure to meet you guys too so GR took me out there. So we loaded up the posters and everything, put them in the back of his car, you know. And they was like, well, if you don't mind staying, you know, we're about to have dinner and we love to have you. They could have had some of the most freshest food ever because they had a farm. Corn. Corn. So the Early corn. farm the table. Right. Uh, it, was serving, like, so. I mean, it was like immaculate. So me and JR stayed and we drove back that night. But that was one of the most best experiences that I ever experienced going to the company to see exactly like how they got down they gave me a tour they showed me how they made the posters mm -hmm. they put the different colors and everything in them the different car stock that they used the different styles so it was an educational day because i wouldn't have never expected that i would thought i just thought it was like a, like a commercial building i didn't know there was a family-owned business mm -hmm. and, we were, and we, how much we supported that family business we would order thousands thousands of them and you were able to fit them in the trunk of a car mm -hmm. heavy Trucks, yeah, yeah, trucks, <laughs> trucks and then, vans, like, whatever. Sometimes we'll go down, spare the moment because we wanted to put up extra promotion for that. So we'll go down two or three days before uh, the event, and then we'll go ahead and start winding them up in the car. Yeah. So how did you secure them to the post? Talk about we, the mechanics of had, that. We had some tie wire. We had to cut about this long. I put it 
arm length, cut arm length. So we would cut literally each wire for each poster, a thousand pieces of wire. We'll take them and hang them. Tie we, up. We, we've also often heard the stories <laughs> about where were the prime locations because this is going to get into the post awards, but but what were some of the primo locations that you would put up these posters? And then I got a follow up question 79th and Stony Island, that right there, and 87th, 87th, and and, and Halston, right? And 95th and the Dan Ryan, Ryan at the end of the line, right at the end of the line was always the point where there was a lot of activity going on, and then we would work our way like on Halston throughout the hundreds. You know, just sprinkling. But we try to hit like the major areas. But I mean, but at a good portion of it, back in our day, the house music was really big in high school. Yeah. So when you come outside out the class, hmm. the poster's sitting outside waiting for you. And we sit at the stands passing hmm. the flyers out. We already got the boards up around the school. So you know what you're doing this weekend. Hmm. It's a party. <clears throat> and the, you use the term flyer. Back in the day, we called them pluggers. Plugger, right? flyer, same right. thing. Yeah. Same, same yeah. thing. No, no difference between the plugger same thing, and the just flyer. a different name. Just a, it, it's like I just had to. Like I feel like I'm a dummy yeah. because of, it's like what well, I, I think me and Terry was having a discussion. I was over Terry Hunter's house, and I was like, I don't use VSTs. He said, but you gotta use VSTs. How are you making your music? But then I really realized that plugins and VSTs are, are the same, same thing. <laughs> Terry to be like, oh, okay. But like, terminology is important, the right? Terminology because is different. It's, you know, even to modern, you know, yeah, it's, south and west. You know, ironically speaking, it's different, but <laughs> it's the same thing. But yeah, some people use a proper, more laden term. Some people say soda. Some people say pop. Yeah. So you know, it, it depends, depends on pop. yeah your vernacular, right? Exactly. And, and so, uh, two things that came to mind as you were telling those stories. One, how did it feel to have your name plastered <laughs> on these thousands of posters that went up on the street signs? What, what was that feeling like? It was crazy because I was in high school, you know, playing with Ron, playing with Frankie and all, you know, all the guys. So my teachers would always ask me, okay, we see that you're playing at the party. Do you think you're going to have your homework done? You know, your homework on this side. <laughs> so this was my terminology. And this is the deal that I made with my mom, with my grandmother. They say, well, you know, we see you doing these parties and all this stuff right here. You know, we see the flyers you're bringing and all that. You're going to be out. But we got a rule. You still got to keep your grades up. You still got to keep mm. some form of a grade point average up. So I came up with a formula, you know, to not, because you know, I didn't want to drop out of nothing of that nation. And I was always real cool with Ron Hardy and Robert Owens, and like Larry Hurd. I didn't have equipment at the time. So I was always going to the north side and I would hang out with Ron Hardy because you know at the young age I was hanging out with Ron and Robert Owens and Fingers Incorporated. So I would go out there and make my tracks at Mr. Fingers' house. Like he'd let me just come over to the house and program on his drum machines and kick it. And they had a group called Fingers Inc. Yes. So they would always give me the promotional stuff. So I would always play all the promotional stuff before the other DJs would get it. And then of course, you know, the guys who I like, I did them copies and so for. So my deal was let me talk to each teacher. Let me get the lesson plans to find out what assignments need to be done because every weekend I'm booked to do parties Solid. and I got to wow. go to school Monday. So what I would yeah. do is I would do my homework ahead of time, get the lesson plans. So let's say, for example, I'm sitting in my English class. They like on page 200 or something. And I'm like, I'm just sitting there doing something else because I'm already ahead of the game. Check it out. Check because I would do my lesson plans first because I was so enthused about doing parties and making my own like my own money on the weekends and so forth that I would just grind down on my work. So I was always a step ahead because uh, I, I created a relationship with my teacher. I, I love this because it's not often that we talk about uh, academia as it uh, but, well, pertains to how it integrated to you know people going out and, and mm -hmm. partying and how you kept yeah. up with it all. Oh, well, Farragut was not an easy school to, to get through. I mean, uh, neither was, was South Shore. So Farragut was like, I mean, I mean, like 70% Hispanic. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it was like a small portion of whites, you know, and like a little scoop of black people, but it was a majority in a Hispanic school yes. in an Hispanic neighborhood. So, 
it was a totally different demographic there. You know what I mean? So for me to be able to have, you know, I got to do all the sock hops and do all the parties and events, we would have to split with like some of the Hispanic DJs. So for example, if the principal gave me a party, me and the principal was like that. Then, I mean, the way to how to equalize it, where we would have to split the ballroom into two sections. So okay, so if this we came and my- played a party, we would have to split the party with some of the Hispanic DJs. And I went to school with a party called uh, now known Hispanic DJs too. Okay. So we would split it up. So we had a four hour sock hop, right? Yeah. So we got a four hour sock hop. So the Hispanics would play for two hours and do their thing. And then we do our thing for two hours, but we just have one hell of a party because nice. both of us together. They put the sawdust out on the gym room floor. And, oh, and y'all like, would get it in. Like school, you put real, your right? can go on and all that. And you put your whatever. And that's how we would have our sock hops. We would have to split because our school was integrated. So we had to, you know, half and half. It. So that was the joy of doing that back then. And and so you mentioned some other legendary uh, DJs, particularly uh, Ron Hardy. And I, I wanted to know what your um, influence and how you play today might have been inspired by Ron. That was like my best friend. I yeah. mean, we were like this. It was, yeah. you know, it was kind of like once we like met, we started hanging out. Of course, you know, he was real stubborn and difficult because I kind of had a crossroads between him and Frankie. It's like Frankie would spoil me and be like, here, here you go. And Ron to make it work. But I didn't realize the psychology that of what he they were both putting me on. Yeah. Well, why, why was you so so rough on one today? And oh, I gotta I gotta you know beat him up. <laughs> so I have a long day with Ron. <laughs> and I have a cool day with Frankie. Yeah. Frankie would come in sometimes and I would pick him up from the Charlie's Club. That was one of his favorite places that he liked to stay. Oh, yeah, on Michigan from. Avenue. Michigan yeah. Avenue. Yeah. And he didn't like to drive. He wasn't into driving. So yeah. at that time, I was just getting my confidence, you know, like learning how to drive on the expressway. Yes. Because Terry used to be my driver. Uh, okay. <laughs> Terry Ter- Hunter used Terry to be my Hunter driver. checking in. So I was scared to drive. So I made Terry drive me everywhere around. Because Terry didn't have no problem getting in a brand new truck and driving me around everywhere I wanted to go. So once I finally got my confidence and I overcame the, 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 the fear factors of getting on the expressway and being confident, I'll go pick Frankie up sometime. We go have lunch and he would give me like un- unreleased music. And he would give me instructions with the music. Okay, mm-hmm. the instructions come with this. Don't give it to this person because they're going to do this. Don't give it to that person. Give it to this person. So I was kind of privileged to be able to get a lot of unreleased material mm-hmm. back then in that era. See, we didn't have internet. We didn't have CD players and all of those sophisticated stuff. We had tape decks with pitch control. We had reel-to-reels. And mm-hmm. you know, we would splice, edit, and so forth. You know, they spoil now. You know, on these, well, do, do you have, do you still have any of that equipment? Everything. I have okay. everything. Got because everything. I still like to do everything. I'm not yeah. just going to, you know, be forced in a corner to be okay. like, okay, this is the new controller that's out. Okay, good for you. If that makes you happy. Do what you got to do. I still love to play my vinyl. I still got the power plant Bozak that Frankie gave me that's with the new face plate on. Wow. I still that's like hot. my analog. I'm still mm-hmm. rotary. I, see, I got CDJs. Of course I do. But I still got my 1200s. I still invest in buying vinyl. I don't, I'm not changing my format because the format changes. I, 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 but I can use Serato. I can use all the technology stuff, like some of the stuff that I'm kind of, I'm like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. You know, the record boxes and finding cues and all that stuff. I think that's dope because the <coughs> technology has given us an opportunity to be able to take things that are old and we can replenish them. For example, I got all my reel to reels and all my tapes when I was 15 and 16 years old. Wow. I'll be 50 yeah. in a couple of weeks. I still use the high quality tape. I can take some of that stuff off of a tape, run it through some compressors, and clean it up and take all the tape hits out, make it sound like it was made yesterday. So that's the dope the, part about remastering, you know, or taking something and reprocessing it and putting it back into its natural state of form because I had the first generation copies. Of, of the stuff songs. of when the Absolutely. artist recorded and yes. never came out. You are getting inside the mind of <laughs> Gene and John Hunt. I want to go back to uh, John because we never got into the whole uh, poster protocol. One of our viewers, uh, DJ Purple, Reggie Davenport, hey, is checking what up, in. What up, what up, boy? <laughs> and he says, you know, there was a code that yeah. 
you also, after putting up those posters, should also go back behind them and and bring them down. Yeah. Was, yeah. was that the code was you practiced? That way. But, yeah. but some, but sometimes we didn't have to because uh, other promoters will have other events, so they'll snatch your poster down, put their poster up. Yeah. So we have to do that. Yeah. So what we did was uh, the other promoters we came together and we talked to each other, communicate when you hang your posters. What day I'm going to hang mine when your event is, blah, 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 blah. So we, we got in tune with that, you know. Um, the new promoters didn't know. So they'll come they didn't back, know the code. They didn't know. So that means automatically I get a phone call at night saying, okay, I'm taking everybody posted down, you know, and they'll take all they, the new promoters posted down because he never contacted that, us. Never. Yeah. Who, who did that call come from? Was it the city or it might it might have been the city? It might have been yeah. a new promoter, any, anybody. Okay, they didn't rec they didn't call us. All the other DeAndre. So there was a collective exactly. uh, consortium that yeah. 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 Me and uh, Lil, Lil Lewis and I we got into a real big confrontation about posters, you know. But we ironed it out, and that's when we came up with the concept. Let's call each other. You got a party coming okay. up. Blah, 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 you know. Blah, blah. Co competition. Yeah. Yeah. That's what kept the circulation. Exactly. I right. mean, there were there were certain points in times where, you know, somebody throwing a hotel party and somebody throwing a party over here and they figure, well, we'll just rip this, rip it off. But rumor will get back that. That's what took your posters down. That's uh, what did we we to. Right. So it wasn't conflict. So what we had to do was just set some form of an organization to where it's, okay, if y'all doing something this week, we'll help y'all. Y'all know some we we help y'all so we can have a form of circulation. You know that was essential back in our day. You know? So I, I want to get into uh, the venues that you promoted at and that you played at. What were some of your favorites, legendary venues because of size or sound system or audiences? Oh, Tell man. us a little bit about in Chicago. In, in Chicago, okay. Yes. Oh well. Um. <laughs> CODs, uh, Medusas, AKAs, Sawyers, uh, the Racquetball Club. We did our thing at the Athletic Club. High, High Park Racquetball. Yeah, yeah. Operation yeah. Push was nice. Uh, okay, and quite a few more. Um, and, and why were some of the ones you listed? The hotel here? parties were also mm -hmm. dope. Like, you know, we do yeah. the Bismarck. Yes. We do the Ascot Hotel. Hotel um, in the Continental. The Hotel Continental. Um, yeah, you guys hit the Allerton at all? No, no not the no, Allerton. Not no, the Allerton. I used to, I used to work at the Allerton years ago. Yeah. AKAs, coconuts. Yeah. Um, shelter. Did you did you ever have residency in any of the Chicago clubs or? It was pretty much uh, well. It always varied because different promoters would have different events. Yeah. So I kind of felt like this. I was in like all the promotions that you probably can be in. I worked with Lewis, did stuff with Diamond Corp. I was in Gucci. I did stuff with John. And then I was also with DeAndre with Galaxy. So we would all like piggyback off of one another because we kind of built the spectrum, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was like, well, okay, I play for the I play for him for this. Okay, cool. All right. I mean, I was in Gucci. So it was like John and DeAndre would get together and collab on parties. So the guys that was in Galaxy would DJ with the guys in Gucci, which was me, Ronnie, and Ferris at the time. When I was in Gucci, yeah, when I mean, Gucci was there before I, I came into the fold, if I'm not mistaken, I think Andre was a part of it. That's, yeah. that's yeah. part of it. But in my era, when I played, it was me, Ronnie, and Frank. I'm sorry, me, Ronnie, and Ferris. And then later on down the line, you know, I put Terry on, so I brought Terry into the fold. Yes, and then of course Farley would always come in here and there and do little stuff. That's how we would just kick it off. T t tell us about the formation of Gucci Promotions and, well, and what that, uh, where that name was inspired from, well, as actually, if we didn't know. <laughs> and actually, we had a group called Men in High Rank. And ah, Men in tell High us Rank, what that Men in High Rank was um, someone else that I really wouldn't really get into that. Okay. I, I, I am, I'm my own boss. And I wanted to have something that I wanted to represent for me. Okay. So um, they had these jogging suits called the Gucci. So I said, well, I'll call Steve up. 
Let's see, I'm gonna name this company. It's the Gucci promotion. Call Steve the Steve Point Dexter. Steve Point Dexter. Steve Point Dexter mm -hmm. Okay, who does so our I, vintage house spotlight yeah. show? So I did that, and Ferris was the main headline at that time. First, yes. okay, and Gene and Andre too. But basically, I was I was really promote. I was really had three DJs that I was promoting: Gene, Ferris, and Andre first. When it was Andre for a minute. Right, Gene. And then Andre. Ryan will come in. Yeah, we'll see the thing about it. So, so Ryan will come all the time. So it'll really be me, Andre. I'm sorry, me, Ferris, and Ryan. Yeah, I still got the poster boards. I still yeah. got the poster boards. Hey man, I'm old. I'm 59 years old. <laughs> so basically, we, we got a place for for them posters too. By the way, yeah, I got a whole, we got, got an archive collection. Yeah. So we we, we yeah. want to get with you on yeah. that. Yeah, so basically, um, started. With, uh, at the racquetball club, well, no, started at Hells Francisco. Yeah, Hells Francisco. And that became like about it was 400 people there. Blah, blah, blah. So every week, the main thing in this business is consistency. Yes. You have to have consistency in everything because you're that's true today. True today. In, yeah. in production, if you don't put out hits, one hit, you lose by a lot. Wait yeah. side. So that's what we did consistency, consistency parties. And I wanted to do the venues that would the kids would like to come out. So what we did was Hales, then we went to South Shore Country Club. Mm -hmm. And then also we had a little club called the Pleasure Dome. Where was the Pleasure Dome? Pleasure Dome was on 75th and it's changed. Yeah. So that was so on the ground. Was, woo, we had two seven foot speakers in there, some horns and lights. And the kids went crazy. They loved Pleasure Dome. Yeah. And then we then when I got a contract with the uh, uh, High Park Athletic Club, and after a few parties there, we started escalating our crowds from 1,100 to 1,800 to 22, 2,300 people every three weeks crazy. for three or four years. That's so amazing, right? And These are indoor venues, 2,200. 18 plus. What what would you say were the demographics of of that crowd all over yeah we promoted when when i say we promoted every school it's no joke catholic schools public you schools private every schools school from the west side uh, to the south side, side to, to the, the suburbs. Side to suburbs but then a fun part about what we also used to do too is that we had like contracts with schools mm -hmm. uh, so like you know kenwood homecoming we had that on wow one night he surprised me so i got a surprise for you i said what you got surprised for john he said no brother i got a surprise for you i see the flyer me and ron hardy and leo ron opened it up for me mm -hmm. at leo in the basement there's mm -hmm. some sweat box in there you yes it, i i've ron been hardy to leo there. Yeah. Moving there. i mean so, think about places like the hummingbird Mm -hmm. Places like the General Persuasion with the Wayne Woods is like the dopest sound man in the city. Yes, he yes. threw a party. Yes. He threw his own party. Earthquake. He threw his own party one night. He had me, Lewis, Ronnie, Andre, I love this. Mike Williams, Ferris. It was all six of us playing. You couldn't imagine how he brought everything out of his garage at that time and how rumbling he had both of the rooms. He did. The windows cracking. Uh, Louis Green West says. Uh, couldn't beat Navy Pier for a Navy party. Pier. Talk Navy about Pier. Navy Lolita. Pier. Oh my Navy God. Navy Pier with Lolita Holloway. <laughs> that had, was a night ooh. right there. Chicago yeah. Zone, 50, rest in peace, Lolita Holloway. 5470, something like that. 5400 people. And what happened was we had um, DeAndre, um, Park Avenue, Gucci, and of course, Farley. So these Four promotion sound companies sound and sound engineers all came together. Yeah. Came together, yeah. and we put that show together, and it was phenomenal. That we ballroom it, hasn't been filled up ever since. Ever since we we called it what was the uh, I can't remember. Atlanta was ridiculous. We Atlanta, had, we had Lolita the Holloway. Oh, we had a good time. It was packed. My auntie performed with Lolita the Holloway. We had Derek Main Strange Life. Uh, Marley mm -hmm. played, I played, Ferris played, Steve mm -hmm. Hurley played, Ron Hardy played. I remember that night, baby, because I had some blue leather pants on. I had the flu. Steve was like, I know you're sick, but you're going to have to come to this. You can't miss this. You had a Michael Jordan esque <laughs> night, huh? Where you came with the oh, flu. I had to do. I was, oh, mm -hmm. dude, I was sick. I was sick that night, but it was one of the 
I've never seen a crowd like so big in that room. Man. So what we did was, this was the concept. Yeah, I remember that night. Farley was like, what? what we do is, you can, you Park Avenue went through a party for a month. I didn't do, do the record ball club for a month. And Galaxy didn't do one for a month. So it was more or less that they was eager. They you wanted built to, up demand. Build, up, build it up. For this. And we promoted, bro. <laughs> so what year was that? This was um, 87. Yeah, I'd say 87. About 1987. 87. 87. Navy 87. Pier. And to show you Epic the event. concept, I'll just tell you about the posters. It was literally a, two days before Navy Pier. Yes. We ordered 1,500 posters and did extra. Everybody was out there. You were grinding. Grinding. Right. Yes. And then we had 54, 70, 54, 70 people. So, so we've done an excellent job of laying the foundation of of some of the history and, and the culture. We talked about fashion. Mm -hmm. We talked about buying records and the movement throughout the city. Mm -hmm. That has evolved, right, to today, 2021, not quite post-pandemic, but we're moving beyond the pandemic, a, a time where we looked inward, right, and did a lot of self-reflection. We did some virtual oh, yeah. activity. Can you talk about how you're emerging from this era based on that rich foundation and history that's been laid? What's what's next? What does the future hold for Gene Hunt, for John Hunt? And what can our audience anticipate? Well, currently right now, I'm, my whole thing is production. It's like, you know, I lacked on not putting out enough material. So now I have more than enough material to put out. So I'm just I'm sprinkling certain things here. During the pandemic, I was, was still working. I mean, I mean, in, I the, still, in the studio, no, um, I mean, I was still, still spinning. I, I was still doing gigs and playing at private functions. Okay, something. okay. So I was still kind of yeah I mean, working because I kind of good. More, I'm a little bit more ambidextrous than uh, yes. in reference to most. Okay, I, mean, I cater to different type of audiences. I just don't stick into one frame. I have a lot of different personalities and identity. Okay, music wise, I play for the hipsters. I play. For Hispanics, I, this, yeah. you know, I'm more multi-dimensional. I'm more multi-dimensional multi with yeah. my skill set, so it enabled me to be able to still function and do those things. But the great part about it, and the most significant part about it, was I was able to be a lot more creative. You know, I got one album sitting under my belt. Yes, and you know, I'm in the process of another album that's almost being completed. So it got me a chance to get back acclimated in the studio, to get familiar with being in the board. Mixing board. Then I had so much material that I had already salvaged. So I was able to do projects and deal with different companies over in Europe because I wanted to base a lot of different stuff. But some of my nostalgic pieces, okay. I wanted to put those, you know, a few in Germany, a couple in Amsterdam, a couple over here in London, a couple over here in Sweden, and just kind of let everything transact. So when it comes to a head, I'm able to have some of those things because their old sound has ultimately came back into focus. It's and it's a demand for it. So Absolutely. This happen, There's a renaissance of music. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the name of my album, actually. It's called Renaissance. Oh, wow. Did not, yeah. did not know that. We yeah. didn't plan that at all. It'll be coming soon. All right. We are anticipating Renaissance. And we haven't really even dug in deep to your production and, and remastering and recreation. Um, but I want to hear from John, and then we're going to double back to that process because you talked a, a a little bit about distribution, okay. which is an important part of how this thing has gone so global as a phenomenon. So John, what has the, the pandemic era brought about for you in terms of any kind of reflection or reinvention or renewal? Renewal and reinvention. Um, basically for me, my era, it's come and gone. I am working with Reggie Corner. He is the man. Uh, we both have skill sets that we put together. Complimentary so we, skill sets, yes. Wow, we complement each other. Um, the pond, the fishes in the pond is just too much. So my interest right now is um, putting together a artist's platform event 
of all facets of the arts. And um, it's going to be the second Monday of each month, starting October. And I believe what, what I want to do is um, bring up a new up and coming new talent. Okay. That, Give them a platform. That talent to, that you have. Ex that express gift. themselves. Yes. And move forward. You're we bring in, we bring in um, production people um, to, to just look at them and see uh, producers, record executives, um, all over. Um, like I said, it's going to be an artist's event. So, coordinary to models to uh, spoken word, everybody. What, what I've been um, just framing in my mind is that you're like the ultimate A&R guy, right? Yeah. And it is not just singers or performers, it's artists of all dimensions, dimensions. And, and types, visual artists, yeah. dance artists, musical artists. So that's my next. My stay next stay tuned for John It's coming up. It's coming up. So you stay tuned. It's going to uh, Artist really experience. High. Yeah. All right. All right. There's that expression again. All right. All right. All right. All right Let's punk right. out, yo. Uh, I'm again having these flashbacks, but I also wanted Gene to talk about his production as we have a few minutes left in tonight's episode of Vintage House here on WNUR 89.3 FM in HD1. We're in studio. We've been talking to Gene Hunt, DJ, remixer, producer, John Hunt of Gucci Promotions. Artists and repertoire extraordinaire is, is the title I just gave them. Um, Gene, talk to us a little bit more, more about your production prowess and and why you feel you know Renaissance was an appropriate name at this time for the music you're you're putting into the universe right about now. I mean, with a simple fact of just kind of shying away from it. And not being able to, you know, to put some of the things out that I was doing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I kind of took a, a, a high eighties, and I think maybe the last album I dropped it might have been like two thousand thirteen or something. So okay. I figured that this would be a way for me to get back into the swing of things and try to somehow slowly start to manifest in different compositions throughout. So the pandemic was very useful in reference to me dealing with a lot of the little cornerstone labels to get off what I would consider my scraps but to still generate some form of buzz so when that all goes full circle, it prepares myself to being able to bring out the serious stuff. So I kind of already started by um, doing a song called For The Day. It was just featured on Glenn Underground's label, Strictly Jazz Unit, just to, just to put something out in the atmosphere right now to kind of get some of the old out yes. to bring in the straight new. So it was things that was already being I mean, that was there, but it's starting to create some form of a platform. So right now, record's doing fairly good on that. But I think I'm in the same token. I'm still working on the Renaissance album, and I just finished another album that's previous to that called Dad's Toolbox. And it's basically like DJ tools and essentials. Yeah. The guys <laughs> who like to have, you know, beat tracks, you know, so forth, more dubby, I mean, like more track and more elemental stuff. For guys who just you know, like more like tracking instrumentals, Renaissance is technically more live vocals, instrumentation, musicians, so forth. So you get the yin and the yang of what's about to be implemented. And what that does is it puts me in another perspective to be able to have a little bit more of a musical competition. And the compositions out as focused more or less on the DJ thing is one aspect of being a sound. God, what have you. There's one aspect of it. We're looking at it in a more production sense now to put out more material and to be able to say, man, I just bought this new track by Gene. It's bang. Who made that track, Gene? I didn't even know he made tracks. It's like, yes, it's time to start putting things out in the forefront. So I figured that would kind of give me some forms of balance. And that's just putting out more jams and just focusing more or less on the production. As far as doing gigs and all that, that's always been there. It's always going to be there. That's set in stone because that's something that's already been self-generated and created. 
But I think that being able to work with different producers and start my label right now would be a good objective. What, what's the name of the label? The name of the label is going to be Hydra. It's the name of the label. And That's hot. Right. There's going to be a subsidiary of Strictly Jazz Music, which is Glenn the Underground mm. label, and it's going to be a subdivision awesome. of it. So. Glenn is more or less like our John Coltrane and our Miles Davis Cole, awesome. of house music. He's your self-taught musician and, and just a genius extraordinaire. Yeah. So what I thought it would be a good, um, good way for me to bounce. He's getting everything set up for me. He's showing me the rope and he's giving me the interest that, I'm looking, that I need in reference to having my sound. It's more yes. formulated to the way that he grooves. You know? I had other options, obviously, but you know, sometimes we have self-righteous individuals that want to be self-righteous, but God bless them. All right. What I got to do is necessary and what I got to do. So well, like any industry, we like any genre, that, that is the case. But we've got a community that thrives here and, and the Vintage House Show is proud to be at the center of helping uh, this community to thrive. We've got Maurice Joshua checking in. All right. Z what's up, what up Mo? What's Z going on, bro? He says, Gene Gong and, and John, do it, do it. Do that thing. We are uh, just about at the top of the hour. And because this is the Philosophical Grooves edition of Vintage House, we always take a moment to ask a philosophical question of our guests. <laughs> Nothing is off limits but there is no right or wrong answer it's just a perspective and so the perspective that i'm looking for from you is if music were to be a language other than english right what language would you equate the kind of music that you produce what would it be closest to something that's not english what language? This is for Gene, and then we got one for you too, John. I don't think that it would be in a, like a perspective of a language. I would think it would be more or less an emotion or, ah. feeling or something that would be designated as I mean, somewhat of an inner soul or a metaphysical feeling. Mm. I don't think that a language can be Talk about it. by something that can be identified as a movement or a pulse. Mm. I've always had this thing called rhythmic. It's called rhythmic calisthenics. Mm. It's more or less like a therapeutic musical yoga. Rhythmic calisthenics will give you Dope. a sense of how you're absorbed by it without having to use other things, but using your spiritual and your inner consciousness mm -hmm. to be able to take your music without a, a language. It's an expression. It's more or less an aphrodisiac that's being presented throughout the airways of the speaker. I'm a lot different than most. So I, I put myself into a category to being not a DJ, but a sound architect. I, I have so learned many I new things. I don't know if tonight. anybody can relate to that. I hope that they can. I'm pretty sure that most people I mean, can understand the continuity of it. You know, I know, like, for example, Maurice Joshua, the way he makes music. I've been running one of his joints lately, and I can hear like the different elements. Mm -hmm. I've been playing "We Fall Down," and I think it's so dope how he, you know, he lets it, he lets it grow, he gives it a little minute, and it just comes right in and just, you know, it oversaturates the sound and you feel this poetry and emotion. So when people create their music, they present a part of themselves and they create some form of a definition, and that's what I look for. It's the ingredients that you put. And that recipe of what you create and what you cook. It's just like being a musical chef. You put those different ingredients in, inside of it and it makes the stomach feel good and it's tasty. And it goes to the brain and it gives you that sense of something that is amazing. This is our sensory projections of us being musical notorieties. That's what I think my interpretation of it would be. I've just uh, redefined my uh title of the show tonight <laughs> sound, sound architect uh philosophical grooves edition we we gotta make sure we got gene back on philosophical grooves edition this, of vintage this house is my, this is my interpretation. Re reggie says that was so deep we need to put the scuba gear on to dig <laughs> to dig that and then uh terry hunter's just checking checking in 
Uh, what up, Terry? What up, much, boy? much love he sends to John and Gene. Uh, Maurice and Joshua show. blown blown away. <laughs> uh, really great show is one of the comments. We want to hear from John about um, you talked a lot about these uh, massive indoor events that were were part of your history. Uh, if you were to compare some of those events and, and the number of attendees to a body of water, what body of water would it be? Would it be an ocean? Would it be a sea? Would it be a lake? What would that it would be an ocean. equal? Graph. It would be an ocean. Why, be why would it equate to an ocean? It would equate to the ocean because it's the body of water, how deep it spreads, how deep, how wide it spreads, and how deep it is. House music is 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 a soul. It's in your it's in your soul, and 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 the, the expression everybody said, "Well, house music, man, this is a way of life for us. It's a culture. It's a culture. Yeah, lifestyle. The movement from day one got me. You know, it, it took my it took. I can be hurt. I got arthritis. I can be hurting." As soon as I could hear some sound, some house, I would dance. I would get up. It, it's 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 um, it's an epiphany. You know? It's funny that you say that it's because epiphany. I can recall a moment where we would always set up. It's like when we did the racquetball club, right? We would set up on the top pier where they would actually run the track. Yes, we would set the equipment up up there, and then you would look above. On the tennis courts, on the tennis feet. Feet. and it would be a sea of people. thousands of kids. Yeah, I, I have the pictures and the proof to show it. But in, when you're looking down, because we're up here high, mm -hmm. when you sit down, you just see the whole court is filled, mm -hmm. just like the children filled. field picnic. Just a it's sea filled with people. bodies, and everybody's on the same yes. mental page. I, so I, it, feels, it speaks volumes. I, I've been in those crowds. I've experienced it. And I know the feeling you're talking about, but just hearing you describe it tonight in, in that perspective not only takes me back, but it, it does. It, it reaches in the soul and in your heart and uh, re-emphasizes why this is, uh, whether they, what's the expression, house is a feeling, right? It's a spiritual thing. And we are here with some of the iconic pioneers and architects of Chicago's house, of the global house scene. Certainly, we've got to get uh, Eugene back, you, Gene Hunt, and you, John <laughs> Hunt, uh, back so you can talk about the global influence that things have had. We really tonight spent some good, good parts of this hour talking about the Chicago Foundation um, because we all know how home of house music is Chicago. In fact, there's an exhibit at the Epiphany Center for the Arts, 201 South Ashland, that is exhibiting, um, a, and it's a growing, living, breathing exhibit on um, the timeline, the history of, of house music. If you haven't already, check it out. Get down there, it's there through July 17th. We're gonna build on it. It's gonna go around the city to some other venues as well. But um, right now it's been an adaptation of what was um, at uh, Department of Cultural um, Affairs for the city of Chicago downtown. Uh, what started a uh, gentleman by the name of Rob McKay, shout out Rob, uh, put the, the foundation together, vintage house crew, a Chicago um, uh, Design Museum come together to blow this thing out of the water. Gene, you, you shared that you have some artifacts. We'd love to be able to incorporate some of those. I still got my high school report card. I got pictures of uh, me and Terry when we were kids holding the records <laughs> up. I got pictures of me and Frankie when I didn't have no hair on my face. I didn't throw anything away because I know how valuable these things would be in today's world and how just in case we, we didn't formally get the identity of, of that we deserve that we still have some forms to show 
how we planted you no know, fries, how we went to go see Larry at the print shop. Hmm. And he would come out with his dirty tank top on. Yeah, your flyers over there. Why we got pink paper, Larry? Well, that's the only paper I had. <laughs> the things that we had to go through to make things happen and how we had to put things together spare the moment at last minute and yes. we had to rob peter to pay paul oh, to get a party to go down if something breaks down a needle breaks whatever we had to do back in those days to make situations happen we were able to put forth that effort to make sure that, that we gave people a party and that, they, and that they enjoyed themselves and then once we built that reputation for throwing nice venues or maybe at these events we won them, and then it all just ran its own course once we, we, we gave you, I mean, assimilated that identity. You, so it was important. You were able to win, and um, because of that, you know, we've got comments, legendary. Um, you know, it is our pleasure to have hosted you on tonight's show. One of our great shows, every Wednesday night, we feel that we're doing what we can to uh, elevate the narrative and own that narrative. And you guys took tremendous ownership tonight of telling a part of the story. And so we want to ensure that you're able to come back and tell more of the story. Like I said, talk about the global impact. Oh yeah, had. so much more. It's, I mean, we'll be here for two, three days. It's talking about so many different uh, scenarios or just over the course of or three, four decades of just, I mean, obviously doing it. Like when I sit back now and I reflect on some of this stuff, like I saw some pictures the other day. I was just, you know, I don't, I was on Facebook. And I stopped back and looked at the pictures. I'm like, wow, that's Andre when we was here on Vincennes. Oh, I'm 14 years old. Wow, this is crazy. <laughs> so when I sit back and I reflect on it, and I'm looking at it now, I'm about to be half a century old. It's like, those are some good times. And I was able to experience those times at, a very young age young and age. to be able to sit back to tell these stories to people of next generations and so forth i mean it's it's explicable for me to be able to share some of those things because i actually got an opportunity to be around the individuals that sculpted this whole concept of it to be right there in the midst of all that to see it all go down and to be somewhat a part of it. You, so, you just did, you did cool. open a whole nother cool. um, dimension of, of what what is important about what we're doing here. And that is ensuring that the next generation, right, is able to grasp exactly. and then take it and evolve it into what is next for uh, the movement. And again, we talk about it from these three perspectives of culture, business, and of course, the music, right? So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. WNUR 89.3 FM and HD1 for another episode of the Vintage House Show. It's your main man, Mega. We appreciate all of you. We'll do a little after show on our live stream, Facebook Live, Vintage House on WNUR, and the Vintage House Show on Twitch.tv. <laughs> For now, we are. Phil Maurice, yes. <laughs> the Vintage House Show. Uh, DJ Immaculate cracking up there. Oh my God. Everybody's yeah. tuning in tonight, and we thank you. And we are out. Peace. Thank you. Peace out. Yes. Are we out there? We are not. We're still live streaming. <laughs> Thanks, Mo no. Joshua. No. Appreciate My you. Serious. <laughs> Mom, let me see. I know you got everything. You got some music for the ladies. Probably in one of those record covers, I'm pretty sure it is. From the records and Chicago and DJ, I appreciate you. I, I'm not sure who's behind that handle. Um, DJ Immaculate, Jesus Martinez, what up? What up, Jesus? DJ Immaculate also given the up, stamp of legends. Hey, Much love, family. What's going on, buddy? Uh, what is this comment that Maurice said? Uh, oh, he got a million dollars worth of history. He, you got everything. We, we, uh, we must talk more about that so oh, we can yeah. get it into into this exhibit. Yeah. 
Have you been down? No, my mother told me about it. Okay. My mom is a fashion designer. Have you ever heard of Barbara Bates? Yes. That's mm -hmm. my mother. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so she told me about it. She's like, you need to go down there and take some of your posters down. I'm also down. part of Chicago's history. Yeah. Yes, she is. Yes, yes. She's having her 35th anniversary coming up in October. She's going a big show. Wow, you guys have a super creative fan. Yeah, yeah, we try. <laughs> we try. The modesty here. Yeah. We try. We just want to maintain she it. We've been trying to teach you inspire, man. It's all about part of us. Well, again, I can only um say uh, what a, a major show this was. Oh, we made it. I was, yeah. we, we you said it. you planned on bringing, yeah. bringing you know, massive vibes. All the DJs, they put in work. They put in, I no mean, doubt. I all of them passed out flyers in cold weather. Yeah. Posted in cold weather. They put the work in. Yes. You know, they wanted to make sure that they named was there and, and done properly. All right. So if you were not there working and putting that work in and passing out them flies and hanging them boards up. I mean, I was I was hungry and thirsty back in them days. I wish I did have track source and B port and all that stuff. See, they spoil now. They got these controllers and stuff. You know, they sync it up for you and blend it in for you like I mean, we didn't technology. have social media, we didn't have internet, we didn't have any of that. We just had the flyers, pure hustle and ingenuity, riding the bus with a crate of records. I mean, it was for real. It wasn't Ubers back then, we had no. liveries. Yeah, jimmies. <laughs> <laughs> Gucci Promotions, <laughs> Nuff said, hey, Just Music Radio Promotions, I, right. I love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. This, this we got to do some shows together. Uh, this is Miss Nene, we call her Miss Gucci. Yeah, she, she was here on the show when we, yeah, I had you and Miss Mimi. That's her. Check her it out. Coming up. This festival is July 25th. That's my wife's birthday. Mrs. Mega will celebrate on that day. Maybe we'll get by this festival. She has grown a lot. She, she, she Check it out. Her business is, I believe she got a business together. It is in Washington Park on July 25th, 53rd and Cottage Grove. Check it out. All right, y'all. We're going to sign off so we can get back to the city. But again, thanks for tuning in. We really appreciate you, Gene and John, cracking up, having a good time here in the WNUR studios. I want to shout out my co-host and producer, DJ Lori Branch, Lauren Lowry, and the entire Vintage House crew. Good night. And see you next Wednesday, 10 o'clock, right here on WNUR. Peace. Peace.